Hi, I'm Will Cathcart. I'm a freelance journalist. I was recently caught in the Harrison Offensive, one of the largest and first battles since Russia invaded Ukraine. We came back from the way the tanks, a small sedan came up with lights flashing, coming really fast, telling us not to go that way because enemies were coming up the road. Right now, a story of survival in one of the most dangerous countries in the world. This metal thing, buck right here, propane. When journalist Will Cathcart and a friend decided they wanted to cover rising tensions in Ukraine, they were in for an experience they didn't quite bargain for. When they set out for Mariupol, they didn't realize just what Vladimir Putin had planned. When things started heating up, they decided to make a run for it and found themselves running for their lives right in the middle of the first battle of the war on Ukraine. So we found a driver and we booked it. He asked us which way we wanted to go and we said west as fast as possible. And that took us at a high speed directly into the Kherson Offensive, which is when troops from Crimea went north. And where they, we drove and drove and we just kept passing. First we passed ordnance headed into Mariupol to defend it. Then we started passing tanks and weapon systems headed in the other direction that we were headed towards what would become the Kherson Offensive. Kherson's a port city about 100 kilometers north of Crimea. And that's where really the first battle of that war took place. And we drove straight into the middle of it. We pulled up, we drove up and the tanks, there was a, um, a long line of tanks and weapon systems and uh, personnel carriers. It just got longer and longer until it stopped. And our driver kept going and it, eventually a Ukrainian commander just jumped out on the road and waved us and said, stop, and pointed. And um, that's where the Russians were attacking, just right in front of us. And so and we looked over and we saw all these Ukrainian troops just jumping out of those um, personnel carriers and shooting and firing. And so we turned around, we went back the other direction, and this sedan came at us, flashing its lights at a high speed saying they were attacking from the other direction as well. So then we had to drive back and back and forth. We pulled up at one point by a gas station and realized in front of us was a massive, I'm, I'm guessing either patrol, I don't think it's petroleum because it was above ground. I think it was a, uh, it was a gas container. And that if that was hit, we would be done. So then we drove the other direction and then we saw a tank get hit by an RPG and we realized that our vehicle driving back and forth probably looked like, you know, um, part of, you know, maybe, uh, you know, they, it might've been targeted. They might've thought we were intelligence or something. So we jumped out of that car and we ran, we jumped into a uh, old Soviet truck that it just wasn't part of this war and hid in the back and took out our phones and said goodbye to our families and uh, we both had two-year-old sons and we said goodbye to them. Okay, Baja, it's Will and Rob again. Uh, we're hiding in a truck. Um, we came back from the way of the tanks. A small sedan came up with lights flashing, coming really fast, telling us not to go that way because enemies were coming up the road. So now we are in a truck. They're from here and there in both directions. We are taking cover. Yeah, there's a brick house, we can go there. Um, so, Faja, I guess this is how we're gonna end our little interview. The Ukrainians, Ukrainians are putting up a fight. There's no doubt about that. They are fighting back. This is insane. Um, how this ties back to Georgia is that 
Putin is trying to destroy this place. I don't see any difference between this and the invasion of Poland. So yeah, this connects to Georgia. And if he can do this, then he can keep on coming. And he will, and it'll be the Baltics next, and then Sweden, and he will keep going. So that is how we were concluding our interview. Uh, if something happens to us, send our love to our families. Tika, I love you. Sebastian, I love you. I'm proud of you. And I am so proud of you, buddy. Um, I love you, mom, dad, Tipper, everybody. Gordon, love you more than anything in the world. Proud of you, buddy. That's kind of gut wrenching. I mean, what, what, kind of looking back on it, I mean, what, what were you feeling at the time? Okay, like when I watched that video, I mean, I've said this before, I'm, just, I'm full of shame. Um, because, you know, I put myself in that position and, you know, my son would not have a father if things had gone a little bit differently. We were extremely lucky to get out of there. It, it's hard to watch that video. It's hard to watch any of those videos. Um, so, yeah. We ran towards a concrete structure and we hid beneath it in the dirt. A farmer and a truck driver followed us in there and we just hid quietly while that battle erupted right outside. Later, as it got dark, we went up into the house. I wouldn't call it a house, it didn't have windows, but into the structure and we hid in there. The farmer who had taken cover with us brought us this moldy bed lining, a bag of apples and a bottle of vodka. And that was our dinner. And we just sat there while this battle raged. And then we heard the jets come in and they started bombing areas around us. We realized we were in Russian held territory because we just saw the Russian tanks just pulling in, just one after another right outside the window. Um, and when we had driven back, we saw a bunch of bombed out Ukrainian tanks and a bunch of bombed out and a bunch of dead Ukrainian soldiers. Um, and that was hard. So, but we knew we were behind Russian lines. So when we heard the bombing, we were pretty sure those were Russian jets and that it may not hit us, but we still weren't sure. And they were fighting over a bridge nearby and that was the bridge that we needed to take to get out of there. And that battle went on all night. Um, a source in Ukrainian intelligence was checking up on us and eventually he told me that the Ukrainians had taken that, that bridge back. But he didn't know if in between where we were and that bridge was safe to pass through. And eventually that w we just had to risk it. Um, so when you were, you were in this structure for how long do you think? Was it a night or? Oh yeah. It was, yeah. It was, what um like 18 hours or something it was what what is the was there conversation was there what was happening while this is going on what what do you do when there's a war raging around you and the walls are shaking and and all of that um you know my photographer rob and i were just sort of huddled up beneath beneath this blanket i felt the need to write what was happening. So I was typing on my phone. I didn't want to open my laptop because we were afraid of sniper fire. You know what a, a TV or a laptop looks like in a dark house? It's just, you know, like a beacon. So I was typing on my phone every, on the lowest mode, the dimmest mode, you know, everything that was happening. That was my way of kind of escaping. And, um, and we, we hid there. Um, you know, I, I reached out to some, to some friends, um, my wife, Tika, um, you know, I had my phone on so she could track it and I let her know what was happening and tried to not make it sound too bad, which she knows me well enough to know that meant it was real bad. And, you know, so the structure where we were hiding and it did on the map, it didn't even look like a structure. It looked like we were just sitting in a field watching a war unfold, which is kind of what if we might as well have been. 
there were no windows in that place. And the worst thing for me is I thought I was going to get frostbite I, on, my, on my toes in particular. It was so cold. Um, it's the coldest I've ever been. And that night just did not seem to end. And uh, at one point, I think I, I wrote uh, a guy who was head of the Georgian intelligence agency, you know, how do I keep my toes warm? And he wrote back, well, I'm not a soldier. I'm sorry, I can Google it. And I said, it's all right, man. Um, so it was, it was strange the things we had to worry about. I mean, you know, I think of like the serenity prayer, which is, you know, grant me the, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to tell the difference. And, you know, I couldn't control Russian mortars or bombs from jets. There are so many things I couldn't control. What I could control was frostbite on my toes, and that's kind of what I had to worry about. Um, my friends and people around me, they had to worry about the other things. And so it was hard on my wife and some other friends who were um, watching very closely. But I got some, some messages. Um, my buddy Elliot, who I mentioned, who came, went with me to Georgia for the first time, you know, he stayed up all night just watching that map and said, I'm with you, buddy, and that meant a lot, um, you know. So it was a tough night. And even tougher than that was the next morning when we left, the Ukrainians had taken back that bridge and they had moved their dead off the field and they had dragged the dead Russians out in front of gas stations everywhere. And in a war like that, you know, with tanks and, you know, you're fighting with explosives. And so that means that the people who die are often in pieces. And they piled up those pieces and they left them in places where you could see them. And they did that as a warning to who was to come. And so leaving, when we got to that bridge, right on the top of the bridge where everybody could see it was was the upper torso of a human being. And, um, and they left the human being out so that everybody would see it who passed by. And that was terrifying. And our driver just started screaming and wailing. And at the bottom of the bridge were the Ukrainian troops who'd been bombed all night and had crazy looks in their eyes. And, and they pointed the gun at me. I was in the driver's seat. And, we were talking to him, just drilling him with questions, and um, you know the guy was just shaky as as he pointed the gun at me, and that that you know I thought maybe that was it, but he let us go, and so we drove, we headed back, eventually to Odessa, um, but it would be days before we got home, and we tried to get to the border, and it was backed up for miles. Putin was trying to weaponize Ukrainian refugees. He thought that U Ukraine's neighbors would not let those refugees in, and he was wrong. And that's one of the hopeful stories from this, is how the West has um, gathered together and opposed him. And that was a powerful thing, and that is a powerful thing. But for us, we needed to get out quickly, and so we ended up leaving through Transnistria, which is a breakaway microstate. It's occupied by like 50,000 Russian troops. They just never left. They still have a KGB. They call it the KGB. And the KGB interrogated us on our way out. We were standing in line, and they looked at us, like, and they, you know, I could see them talking, like, Are those two Americans? What, what, what are they doing? Are they out of their mind? Are they crazy? Yeah. And, and they, so they pulled us into their thing and they scanned our bags. And uh, Rob had this Pelican case that looked like a tactical case. It's where he kept his camera, but he was wearing his camera. When they saw that, they were sure that, you know, they had us. There was some weapon in there. And when they opened it up, there was a, a small biography of Benjamin Franklin, which he had brought with him, which is just great. And under it was a bottle of vodka nestled where the camera should have been. And they saw that and they just nodded because that's how they would have stored their vodka too. Instant street cred, right? <laughs> yep. They were like, respect. 
When talking to the Transnistrian KGB, if anyone's ever in that position, turns out honesty is the best policy, but certainly don't tell the whole truth. We didn't say we were journalists. They asked me what I did and I said, I'm a blogger. And Rob said, I'm his photographer for our blog. What, is, what kind of blog? We said travel, travel blog. Because I figured if they Googled me, they would see articles. But they, they didn't know English very well. There was one guy who could speak English. And so they started asking us questions and we just started saying, we were so afraid. It was so scary. It was so scary. We just said that over and over again. Again, we didn't tell the whole truth, but we just told parts of it. And kind of make, to make yourself seem a little bit naive, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like and, you're just tourists yeah. going the wrong direction. And they looked through Rob's camera. Rob had uploaded and deleted most of it, but there was there was still some stuff of tanks. And they said, you know, what are you going to do with this? And I jumped in. and I said, uh, he's going to show his friends at the bar when we drink vodka. He's going to tell stories because it was so scary. And they bought that because again, that's probably what they would have done. Um, and eventually they thought we were crazy or stupid or both, and they, uh, they let us go. Were they right? Probably. Oh, yeah, certainly. Um, were they right to let us go, though? I don't think so. But, you know, who knows? Um, so you're on your way where exactly So on, the, on that road? So through Transnistria, um, Transnistria is tiny. I mean, it's, I, I'm trying to compare it, and it's smaller than Delaware with a third of the population. So it took about 10 minutes to drive through Transnistria and then you're in Mal you know, you're crossing to Moldova, Moldova and we had a, uh, a friend through Georgian Connections, Moldovan guy pick us up, who was also baffled. He was like, why did you go through Transnistria, what? He was so confused, but we just said, hey, you know, it was kind of our only option and it worked out, so. I mean, he was, as glad, he was as happy as we were. Um, so he picked us up and we were very relieved to be, you know, at least on out of Russian controlled territory. At the same time, it was, it was hard. It felt like we were running away and we had left behind a, a bunch of very courageous people who were, you know, we knew were gonna die and who were fighting for their land and their families and their lives. Yeah, wow, so how long did it take you to get to that point when you were out of danger? Um, well, that's a good question. I guess it was, a, it was a couple days. The process was a couple days from when we were caught in Harrison, maybe it was two days, and actually out in, through Transnistria into Moldova. And then from there, you know, Moldovan airspace was closed. Moldova, Everywhere we went, there were news channels blasting just information about this war. The people in Moldova seemed more afraid than the Ukrainians because the Ukrainians are used to this. They've been fighting a war for eight years. The Moldovans haven't, and they know they're next. There's very little stopping Russia from taking Moldova. They, there are even troops in Moldova, in Transnistria. So there was just palpable fear in Moldova and for that reason, we didn't exactly feel safe, and yet we were elated to be there. From there, we crossed the border into Romania, and then from a tiny little airport, took a flight to Bucharest, and then from there, I, I flew back to Tbilisi, and my buddy flew back to Corpus Christi, Texas. So. With a few extra stories to tell in the bar, right? That's right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did he ever show those pictures to anybody in a bar? <laughs> that was the question. Did he? Yeah, you know. Probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Probably. Yeah. So where do you think this goes from here as far as Putin goes? I mean, I know your idea originally was a little bit different than, um, than probably what it is now, now that you've seen kind of what they're doing, how they're targeting civilians, and how this whole thing is progressing. So where do you think it's, it's going from here? Well, I guess the irony for me is that I went back last night, I looked at that op-ed I sent before all this started. Russia is being pushed back to the east and now it is focusing the war on the east. And I suppose that they will pour all their resources into keeping Mariupol and keeping that land bridge to Crimea and that may be how this ends. 
And if that'll stop Ukrainian civilians from dying, that's fine. You know, Putin will be taken care of later and the Ukrainians will probably take that area back. What worries me is that if they are successful in taking even some territory in the east, then they may regroup and try to do this all over again. Putin will try to do this all over again unless he is stopped. And by stopping, that means unless his life is ended and he is no longer on this planet and the planet will be better for it. <coughs> Putin knows that his entire legacy hinges upon this. And it was his choice to do that, to, to start this war, to invade a sovereign country and try to eliminate it. To say that Ukraine shouldn't exist, doesn't exist, and its people don't exist, he's now trying to get rid of those people. To me, that's genocide. People are mincing words over this, but let's just call it what it is. And just listen to Putin. I mean, he's pretty... I, I, I think that's the dictionary definition of it, actually. Indeed. Eliminating people. Right. Yeah. And, and Putin is very... Um, he says what he plans on doing. We just don't always want to hear it. So we try to, we try to put it through a lens of what we want to hear. And it hasn't worked. And it's time to... It's time to stop reacting. It's time to create a strategy. Instead of potentially getting dragged into a war, um, instead of waiting until a rocket accidentally hits Poland and then by Article 5 we have to either desert, I mean, desert Poland or enter, you know, World War III, it would be better to send in a small group of NATO forces and make it very clear there's no nuclear weapons involved, and, but that we're going to stop this. That, that's enough. That's, that's, I think we've reached that point now. And people say, oh, what, that might start a global war. That might start a nuclear war. Um, I think it's the only way to stop one. I truly believe that. That if we don't act, if the U.S. doesn't act, then Putin will keep doing this. And as he runs out of options, then he will become so desperate that, yes, we, it could result in a nuclear war. It could result in World War III. And I think people, I understand why people don't want to, the U.S. to act because they think it will provoke something. But again, thinking it will provoke something is trying to interpret what we think Putin will do. He's pretty clear about what he's going to do that he's going to try to eliminate Ukraine, and then he'll come for the next countries, you know, on its borders, that, that Putin does not believe should be free countries and part of the West. And he'll keep coming. And that will be the war that we're trying to avoid. So again, I think the only way to stop it is by acting. What, um, just kind of ending on this note, I'm curious about how you've been doing since you had this experience. Has this been something that you, I mean, do you see all of this in your head when you sleep at night? Is it, has it been difficult on you or, or how are you dealing with that? When I first came back, every time I saw my, he just turned three, my son, I would, I must start weeping. I mean, that, yes, it, it's been hard, but you know, it ain't about me. I need I put it in perspective. There are people in Mariupol, and that city almost doesn't exist, but there are still people there in the rubble. What they're going through, they're going through every day what we went through in a couple days. So yeah. that's what I remind myself of when I, whenever I start to you know, process this. I don't know if that's healthy or not, um, but you know, this, this isn't over.